Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. So happy to see you <laughs> all together here. Let me open our presentation. <clears throat> and we will start, uh, uh, actually, with uh, a video. <laughs> Yes, I'm familiar with that and with some Wikipedia-related projects. Mm, our first experience was with the actual creation of open educational resources um, for a program uh, on tourism and hospitality. Yes, I have heard of it. Um, I heard about it when I started working at the Writing Centre here at the University. Yes, I have heard of open education when I started working at the Academic Literacies Writing Centre at Nelson Mandela University. Well, actually, I think the key word is uh, interaction because uh, with group works and also group work uh, during the reviewing process, students can increase their awareness of their own skills. I would like it to be an easily available um, uh, easily available to everyone, um, especially within the university context. Open education aims to improve access to education. If people in South Africa had access to education and to learning materials, it would create such a reality where education is accessed by everyone and anyone who wants it and also we'll be more able to create our own content and add to the knowledge base instead of thinking that only one day when we graduate to have a professional career will we be able to do that. And open educational resources is a really really spectacular thing and it gives teachers the flexibility of actually creating content which is you know fully furnished for themselves if you will. I love you guys. You guys have a blast in the conference. You guys are doing, all of you guys here, all of you guys that are watching this, I love you with all my heart because you guys are actually helping us, helping people like me. Bye, good night. So, uh, we've been blessed to, to have a, a good number of students who wanted to share with us their ideas about open education and we are here with the same aim today. I'm so happy, you can't imagine how happy I am to have students on the stage together with me and uh, thank you in advance for the great job we did together and uh, for this keynote together. So, we wanted to start this conference uh, with students on the stage because they are our main focus. I think all of us share this as uh, the main focus. Is it too close, maybe? Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> I'm not used to microphones. <laughs> and um, let's start with uh, who we are. Um, I am Paola Corti. Uh, I work at uh, METID, which is the Learning Innovation Unit here at Politecnico di Milano. And uh, I am the co-chair of this conference. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Trudy Radke. Um, I work as an Open Educational Resource Specialist at College of the Canyons as an as a, um, OER consultant and advocate to California State Universities, and I'm currently pursuing a Master's in History at Cal State University, Northridge. Um, I'm Giulia Buggioli. I'm a Computer Engineering student here at Politecnico, and uh, I'm also a member and currently Vice President of uh, POL, which is uh, Politecnico Open Unix Labs. And I'm Robert Quackenberg. I study comparative literature at the Ruhr Universität in Bochum, Germany. And there, with other students, I initiated the Hermion project, in which uh, students become teachers and teach um, their fellow students. So, as you can easily imagine, we are here providing different perspectives on open education. And, uh, um, of course, uh, um, we will start from their experiences in open education and uh, we are going to go through some of the challenges they have been encountering and they are encountering nowadays actually. And uh, is it not working? We can manage it's, it from here. It's not quite Don't worry. <laughs> 
let's go th through this by hand. <laughs> Don't worry. And um, uh, what uh, we are going to share then is, uh, which is the kind of university, university support that they already received and which, which uh, our university are providing now. And uh, in the end, we are coming to uh, their vision about open education and the vision that uh, we are willing to share with you. And uh, actually, we are going to involve you in that because you've been given a small paper note and uh, we are willing to ask you if you want to write down during the keynote which is your vision about uh, the future of open education. And uh, in the end of the keynote, we would like to collect them. So feel free to write it, change it, uh, correct it as far as you want, and then please share it with us in the end, okay? Uh, what else? Let's start, I would say. Let's start with the experiences. Which are your experiences in open education? Well, for me, first of all, I'm uh, a member of PO, as I said. We are a um, student uh, club here in uh, Politecnico, and our main focus is on uh, free software, and I mean free as in freedom, not as in free beer. Uh, free software, uh, in order to qualify as that, needs to grant its user four main liberties, which are the, the freedom to use the software as they want, to study how the software works, to modify it to suit their own needs and to share it with whoever they want. Um, we organize courses about free software and open technologies. Our courses are open to everyone. They're mainly meant for students, other students of Politecnico, but we also have some uh, older people from outside of Politecnico who come to follow our lessons or who follow our uh, YouTube channel. In fact, we try to share all of the material we produce. All of the slides are licensed with a CC license and they're on our website. And we also record videos of our lessons and they're on YouTube, uh, which is not an open platform, but it's the most used one, <laughs> fortunately. Um, on a more personal note, I'm uh, also a student and uh, throughout my university career, I've always used the material shared by other people who are either students or professors. And that material was so far and of such good quality that I never really needed to buy a book. Um, uh, one uh, thing I noticed is that not much of that material had a license and uh, I'm afraid it might be because people are not even aware of the existence of licenses. Hmm. Uh, my first experience in open actually occurred in my first year as an undergraduate. I went to purchase my university textbooks and it came out to about $700, which is around 630 euro, I believe. Um, I was the first in my immediate family to attend college and I come from a lower socioeconomic background. So that was an incredibly large burden um, for my family that we had not been expecting. Um, I also needed new glasses because my prescription was up. So I had to pick between textbooks and glasses. And I chose glasses um, because that seemed like the more immediate need. Um, I had nothing really to supplement my learning outside of the classroom. So I would just go online and look for things. And I didn't know it at the time, but the only stuff that I was actually able to download for free, because I was able to find a few things, was OER resources. And I didn't know that that's what they were, but now, fast forward, um, that was my first experience. And now I have the privilege of being an OER and ZTC specialist at College of the Canyons. I've assisted in the creation of about 80 open textbooks, um, all under CC by license. Uh, I've also am a co-lead for the OER Student Advocacy Group, Advocacy Group, a group in California that tries to advocate for open on California campuses. And I also work as a private consultant to help other universities make their own open textbooks in California and open textbook pathways. When I, when I hear, uh, truly, when I hear you talk about um, this experience of having to buy books on, on, on this scale, um, I'm just so happy to uh, you know, live in Germany and have the benefits of the very free German, German uh, education system in comparison. Um, but I think it's also just a really Mm, great example of how, like from a from from a need, you can you can come up with a great idea and and, and like a, an urge to to want to change something. And um, our project is of course like not so much um, related to uh, sharing materials and textbooks and and also not have nothing to do really with 
uh, free software. Um, but there was, a, there was a need nonetheless, and um, I can share a little story like yours. Um, so this goes back to, uh, I was living with one of the girls I started the project with, um, at the time living together. And um, we often had this conversation that when, um, you know, we've just written a paper and we thought it was really good, and um, so we're quite happy about what, what we did there, and um, we felt it was valuable, but we didn't know how to share it with anybody. It was just um, the professor who had to correct it, and um, maybe like a friend who, who read it to, to check it for you know, errors. Um, and those are the only people who ever, ever got to see this, and we thought like, there's something that uh, we want to change about this, and we want to make student research more visible. And so this was, the, this was the need that we discovered and what we wanted to do with our project. And um, what we do is basically we give students, um, I'm from the literature department, so it's uh, students from a number of philological subjects um, that get to present their research. Um, so it's pre-selected, it's, it's really good stuff, like good bachelor's thesis and so on. Uh, or master theses, or also like smaller projects that uh, have like outstanding research quality, and they get to present it to other students. Um, so in this way, we make we make their work more transparent. And um, what we also do is we don't stop with the finished product because, in a way, we think very often um, education is also not open or not transparent. Um, in a way that when teachers present their work. They only present the finished product, but you never get to find out like how did you even get there. And um, so what we do is all our students that um, teach in this class, um, they get to actually first work on reflecting themselves on how did they even get there um, again, and then um, they also present this to the other students. So they serve as role models um, and encourage these other students to maybe follow in their footsteps and learn, learn from their experiences. Um, and of course, because we've done this project now three times, um, there's also another level at, at which um, sharing uh, comes in, and this is um, educational practices. So we started this as students. We had no idea about what we were doing there at the beginning. Um, but now, of course, we've learned from our own experiences, and um, we're trying to develop this course further and further, and so we've started sharing um, at this level also. Um, when it comes to the open educational resources, I think it would be just a, a great like puzzle uh, to to like uh, to add in there as well. Um, but um, I mean, you mentioned the, the challenges. One challenge that we found, um, especially as students um, trying to find our way in this, is that you need to know quite a lot of things, or at least it feels that way, um, to get started with um, uh, with sharing stuff online and. Um, we didn't feel prepared to, to do this at the, at the beginning, so we want to do this in the future, but so far it's been like a little bit of a challenge for us to incorporate that in, this in our concept. Well, let's talk about the challenges in sharing then. Um, in my experience, uh, the main challenge I've encountered is that people don't provide a source code, which could be, for example, I've found some uh, really good notes, but only the PDF version, and uh, if there was a mistake or I wanted to correct or something that I wanted to improve, I was unable to do that. I think in order to be really open, you need to not only provide the editable version of your work, but also all of the tools that another person is going to need to improve and continue working on that. Um, another issue, I believe, is um, that without a proper CC license, it's impossible to give credit to each of the authors who contributed to the work. And uh, since we are sharing our material for free, this uh, credit is kind of the only form of payment that we get. So I think we need to use a CC license for that. Um, another issue when I was looking for material to, to study for my exams, for example, that I found was that um, material is extremely sparse and it's published on uh, very many different platforms, which makes it a lot harder to find. Um, one, thing, one thing that I think would help to solve this problem is to have a centralized platform, maybe sponsored by a university, like each university could have their own website where, there, where students and professors can share their material and they are of course strongly encouraged to use an open license. 
What about you, Robert? Did you encounter any other challenges? Um, yeah, first of all, I, I think this, those are so, so important points that you mentioned, like having a, an accessible platform would just be fantastic. And um, I think there's maybe one other challenge, um, that, or like one reason why we found it so challenging in, in, in our situation um, to, to use this more, and that was um, that we didn't design uh, our, our project in, in a way uh, with this in mind. And when you want to do it like retrospectively, it's so, so much harder um, because like also in our case, it's not just one teacher, it's this group of students. So we'd have to run after everybody and you know, get their consent and, and uh, also um, just rearranging the material afterwards like in, in a way that it's openly shareable is just really, uh, really hard. So I think one takeaway from this is that you really need to make sure that you design it for sharing from, from the beginning, and that's one thing that we want to do in, uh, in, in the future. And this is, I think, something that also applies to whichever other person you want to encourage to participate in this, in this movement. You've got you to gotta reach them at a point where they can still uh, design whatever they have planned uh, in, in this way. Well, yes, I agree. Instilling an open culture at the beginning of a work would, uh, uh, would save us a lot of time after the work is done. But um, Paula, you and I are both at home here at Polytechnico. <laughs> what is it we do here to help solve these challenges? Well, actually here um, I talk about uh, what the work we do in METID, which is a bottom-up work, of course. Uh, what we do around uh, licenses, first of all, is try to support uh, teaching staff in order to have the basic skills they need in order and to work in advance. So if they start thinking about licenses before they start their work, then they will be able to share what they produce accordingly. Otherwise, it's quite difficult to go back and catch up with the work already done and the, all the permission required. Sometimes it works. Uh, actually, one of our last experiences uh, since we produce MOOCs, uh, and our MOOCs are really open MOOCs, so uh, CC licensed MOOCs. Uh, we, uh, one of our, the last MOOCs we uh, published uh, is about uh, the relationship between higher education and sustainable development goals. And actually, we started with a more restricted license, but then we came up, we came up discovering that most of the professors involved, and there are more than 30 professors involved, uh, chose uh, by themselves uh, the CC BY license. Then we contacted each one of the others and asked them for their permission to change their license. And they all agreed. So the, we have our first CC BY, completely CC BY MOOC uh, now online. So MOOCs are one of the other activities that we try to do together with professors because mainly we work with them. And uh, sometimes we succeed in uh, adding also some of the works done by students. For example, in this MOOC we have also a video completely designed by students, which is, <laughs> which is nice for us. And um, other things that we try to do together with the teaching staff, uh, during workshops uh, we have uh, specific lessons for them uh, in which we work together around the licensing. And uh, they work actually in order to choose their license, understand what, what does it mean to remix uh, different uh, OERs together. And what we encourage them to do, and sometimes this is uh, already happening, is of course to reuse other professors' uh, materials. And it works pretty well when uh, we succeed in doing this. Other things that we try to do at present time in order to support uh, professors in their day-by-day -day wor day -day work is to encourage them to open up their practices, not only with open educational resources, but also sharing their practices in themselves, so the design of their lessons. So also the process, Robert, not only the final result. And uh, sometimes it works. It's a step-by-step -step activity. The last thing that we try to do, I'm very happy about it, uh, is uh, the translation of the uh, Creative Commons uh, Certificate for Educators and Librarians in Italian, because language sometimes is still a barrier and we don't want that. So having, uh, having uh, the Italian version could support many of our uh, professors at national level 
to, come in to get in touch more closely to the licensing system, which is not so easy for everyone, you know. Even if the materials are very simple, very user-friendly, sometimes people are frightened by facing uh, legal issues. And uh, even if we are not uh, a legal team at all, uh, we, can, uh, we, we can try to support them at first. So that's what we are trying to do. Uh, what we want to do in the future, since we are reaching that point, <laughs> is to have a, a larger involvement by students because professors have a limited amount of time. So we certainly understand when they have problems in knowing better how to do, uh, how to deal with licenses, okay? It's perfectly understandable. Uh, but if the network becomes larger and larger, and the, the, why not to involve students in this network? Uh, the, the work with licenses, which is very time consuming at first, could be managed with, with many people on board. And I really believe that students could grieve, give a great deal of effort in this, and they could be really the game changer. So that's why I'm willing to, do, to go ahead with this. Awesome. Um, it's really encouraging to hear all of the work, as I've been here, that's going on at Polytechnico to bring students into the open creation process. That's something we try to do a lot at College of the Canyons, uh, where I work with OER. Um, we actually recently hired two graphic design students from College of the Canyons to help us design kind of an OER textbook. We call it style guide, but it could also be considered kind of a workflow, a how to create an OER text from scratch, basically. If you were someone who wanted to get into open content creation, but perhaps you didn't know where to start, uh, we had two graphic designers just help us create an entire branding initiative for our campus for OER, help us market OER, created banners, merchandise. And it was amazing because they, I mean, the work that they produced is gorgeous, and they agreed to put it all in a CC BY license. And then they agreed to compile it all into a document that we're gonna share on our website soon, and it's a packet. So it's not just information on how to create content or a textbook, it's all of the materials you would literally need to do it. Like textbook graphics, they've made them, they've put them in that packet. All of the banners, everything, all their designs, and it was, they were so excited about it. They were so excited, they wanted to do it. It was, it was quite brilliant um, and a privilege to work with them. We also are currently working with a former COC student who is blind. Her name is Lauren Rome, and she's helping us create an accessibility guide for textbooks. It's very important to us at College of the Canyons that the visually impaired have access to our books in, um, in a way that is equitable and real. And we, are, we have someone helping us create an accessibility guide, and we have the person who should be helping us create it. And that's been really impactful for me and our whole team. Um, and these are students, and they're excited, and they're willing to do it. Uh, we also have professors who we're encouraging to bring into the process, uh, bring students into the process. So we have a geometry professor who's actually assigning uh, questions for credit, homework questions, and then his students are literally writing the homework section of his textbook, and they're vetting the problems, and they're doing all the math work, and they're showing the work, and we're just going to lift that and put that right in the textbook. We also have a geography professor who takes his students on field trips every year, and they take pictures of California geography for our upcoming California geography textbook. So we're, these students, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create incentive and buy-in. We feel that if they see themselves reflected in the materials they're using, they will care about the materials they're using. And we think that that's really powerful. Um, we're also working on Another small change that I've noticed that's just been really impactful is we're actually going into our textbooks and we're changing some of the names of the content to reflect the names of our current student demographic. And the reason I think that's so powerful is because it's a very simple thing to do, but it's actually only something you can do with open. You can't call a publisher, email a publisher and say, you know, these names, they don't really reflect my students. Can we change this work problem to use names that reflect my students? But with open, you can make that change. And it only takes a couple of seconds, really but it's so impactful. Um, there's a famous American educator, uh, Marina Elderman, who said that you can't be what you can't see. So when we bring our students into the creation process, when we bring their names into the textbooks, there's incentive and there's buy-in and there's care. Um, and I think it's really been powerful, it's been powerful for me to watch that happen. I honestly just feel like I'm part of the process. Uh, and 
last but not least, um, I'm, like I mentioned earlier, I'm working with a group of advocates from California to create a OER toolkit that will be used by other campuses, hopefully, to brand and spread OER awareness on their campus. We're going to publish that sometime in late December. Um, and last but not least, I and my two OER colleagues at College of the Canyons who design these materials, we are currently graduate students. And we're starting to realize as we work that we will be students for the rest of our lives. And that's kind of the mindset we hope to bring to open education. Thank you, Trudy. So if we are going to, if all of us are going to be students for the rest of our, of our lives, now it's maybe the time to go forward and move to the vision for the future. And uh, what about you, Robert? What is your vision on that? <laughs> well, I think after that very inspiring stuff <laughs> by you, Trudy, it, it's, uh, maybe it's a bit tough act to, to follow there. Um, but, I mean, when, when I think about like, um, also the kind of stuff that we shared, and we talked a lot about this um, together, mm, I think there's, there's, a, there's, there's some common denominators, of course. There's, it's about access, about transparency. But, I mean, we're all students. Uh, to me, it's a lot about empowerment really and um, we've had this before like actually this, this morning um, you know we, we heard about like how the relationship between education uh, or uh, the university and society is, is evolving and changing becoming more complex and um, I think in, in this this day and age um, we need more than ever we need active citizens mm -hmm. and um, if we want active citizens we need to have um, active students in, in our education system and so wh what I take from working, working with you and, and thinking about this really is um, an encouragement that there is an, an open future possible in which everybody can contribute and everybody has, has, a, has a place to, to shape this uh, and not just the education but then society at large. So maybe we can think about uh, some practical roles that students could cover, something like uh, being co-creators of content, uh, which means working on homeworks uh, to uh, support professors in designing texts, uh, supporting them in preparing examinations also, or to improve them, uh, um, share their, their already done exercises with others uh, through licenses so that they could be reused for different activities instead of getting lost in time uh, and wasted in a way, you know. Or also we can think about students as a tu licensed tutor, let's say, uh, because you are all smart and if you get to know licenses you are uh, the best advocate possible uh, to work with the professors and teaching staff in order to support them, understanding them better and also keeping it simple, you know, it's not such a big deal to work with licenses, you can do it and uh, it could be good coming from students also or also students could be good peer, te peer teachers as you already are doing you know, extending this practice uh, uh, as a, something that you can uh, start working on consciously, not because it comes up to you as a chance, because you encounter such uh, some Hermione project or you are lucky because you have friends who already work with licenses, you know. It could be really worth it because a student could really gave, give a great contribution to the building of this big network. Yeah. Some of the projects already, I mean, this conference is full of projects uh, that are already talking about the role of students, and some of you are already involving them largely, which is something that I hope we could do also in the future. Um, but uh, it's something that could be really, really improved. Yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely right, and it's important to um, not just have like the dream, the vision, um, the grand thing, which is also important. I think we need that, um, but at the same time to think of what are the concrete like, steps and then simple steps that you can take? Because um, like, from my own experience, I think, uh, or everybody has had probably this experience at some point, that um, you need to find a way into something. Like, and and it, it's, it always helps that the, the initial threshold is, is not too, mm -hmm. too high. It's not too hard to become involved. Um, so as, as you say, like, um, there's so many simple steps where students can start to become involved if, you know, uh, they are being trusted to do so. Um, 
and then of course they can build on that and, and become more and more involved. Um, so in, in the ideal uh, world, this is of course like an open spectrum so that you can, at the end, you can design entire curricula and everything uh, together with, with the faculty uh, and become really empowered this way. Um, so I think this, the, the small steps is really the one, one important thing. And the other important thing, I think, is, is the role models. And when you, when you had that, this fantastic quote about you can't be what you can't see, yeah. um, this is one of the, the, the reasons why we think our project is working so well and it's, it, it shows in the evaluation that we have, is because the students see uh, another student appear um, being this, this, this teacher and, and, and being able to do, to do this stuff. Uh, they become inspired um, themselves. And we've just had like a, an application for the next year where somebody actually wrote this. So I was at the first uh, thing you did, and I was at the second thing, and now I feel ready to, to, to do it myself. So it's working. And I think this, this goes for all kinds of student involvement. If you see somebody then you feel, who's a peer, then you feel empowered to do it yourself, maybe. Hmm. Okay, so maybe before we go, we leave some time for the questions. Uh, we can share with you uh, why we chose these kind of images for our keynote, because uh, actually there's a reason. <laughs> uh, um, we, as you can see, there is a painter here, and uh, he's uh, preparing a wall. Uh, all the, the pictures we shared with you today through this presentation are, take, are uh, pre done by this painter, this artist, whose name is Afran. Actually, he works uh, very close to here because he works uh, in Lecco, which is uh, 50 kilometers north from Milan. And uh, we came up with uh, these images by, by chance, uh, searching f from Pixabay. <laughs> and, uh, actually, uh, you will find the, uh, the explanation in the presentation later on. But uh, what we did was to choose a mural first because we wanted to have uh, uh, something coming up in the open and uh, uh, the wall in this way is seen uh, just as a support not as a boundary you know so that's the meaning we wanted to have in our presentation and that's why we chose those images and uh, Afran we contacted him actually because we had the chance to get in touch with him he was very proud of being uh, uh, with us on the stage but also even if he is a artist, he wanted to know everything about open culture and uh, he is willing to join us uh, in the future in order to produce a piece of art uh, uh, to be shared in the open. So <laughs> the word is spreading. I mean, we just have to continue working and uh, advocating, I think. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I'd like to add a, a word about how we worked to prepare this keynote. Um, first of all, there were no bosses, even though it's officially Paula's keynote. And uh, I, I'd really like to thank her for inviting us here and giving us a chance to be here. Um, then uh, we try to always use open source software for our work. I insisted on that, but they all agreed. Um, we used uh, an open source software to do our conference calls. Um, we ended up using Google Docs for our notes. Uh, we had to because it just works so well. Um, but what I'm really grateful for and really happy we did is uh, we, even though we are four people with completely different backgrounds from opposite sides of the world, who truly had to wake up very early to participate in our calls, <laughs> Um, but we managed to get together and to put our thoughts and ideas together to share something with you. And uh, I, I hope we managed to, to really communicate our love for open in general. And just really briefly to go off of what Julia said, um, I feel extremely empowered and privileged to be on the stage with these people. I've gotten to know them over the past uh, couple of months and it really reminds me that there's people <laughs> Literally, I mean, this isn't called OE Global for nothing. There's really people all over the world that are doing this, and this is a, a tangible reminder for me. Um, and that's really the goal that we have in doing this for the keynote, is that we want all of you to feel personally and individually empowered, because it is that individual empowerment practiced on a daily level that is going to lead to greater open advocacy, um, policies, and acceptance. 
So thank you very much for being here and, and taking the time and sharing your time with us. Now, the, the one thing that I would maybe add is that, of course, it takes more time if you work on this, like with four people, and that not just everybody says their little thing, but you try to communicate like a common message. It took more time, but it was worth all the time it took, because um, I think, first of all, we got to know each other in the process, and then I think it just turns into a, a whole different kind of thing and a, a different kind of message that we can communicate, hopefully, uh, to you today. Well, now we have to ask one last thing of you. Um, remember the papers uh, that you were given at the beginning? We asked you to write your uh, visions of the future on them. And now, if you're as open to sharing as we hope you are, we ask you to give them back to us as you leave the room. And they will be put on a poster upstairs for everyone to see and maybe draw inspiration from. And, uh... Just one last thing. Uh, at the beginning, we, we skipped uh, this part. Uh, there is a quotation here from Offer. As you can see, it's 1973, so it's nothing really new, actually, you know. But uh, the thing is that if we want to be learners for the rest of our lives, and we don't want to consider ourselves learned, we have to give away something, in a way, you know, which means uh, in order to make room for something new, in a way we have to unlearn something and relearn, okay, from scratch. And to do, to do this properly, I, believe, I strongly believe that uh, the contribution from students could be really worth it and really uh, powerful. So thank you all for your time. And if there is any question, we have five minutes maybe, so we can manage with some of them. <laughs> Is there any question? Okay, I can give you the microphone. Yeah, thank you so much. That was great to listen to your practices and experiences. Great choice, glasses are more important than <laughs> textbooks. <laughs> also, good to know that now there is the very first CC BY um, MOOC available. If you have one wish from your university, what would it be? God. Whoever wants to start okay. is uh, welcome. <laughs> Should, do we is this, is this being recorded? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, yes. Hopefully. <laughs> um, no, seriously, I would say um, trust, trust the students is the, is the, the key thing for me um, because it will pay, it will pay off. Um, this, this probably applies to my university just as much as to, to ma most, most other higher education institutions that um, there's, there's a lot of room still for, for more trust to be put uh, uh, in, into students and giving them more of a say you know, over there, over what they want to learn, why they want to learn it, and um, how they want to learn it, and um, maybe even how they want to teach their peers, as in our case. Uh, well, for me, it would be encourage sharing because it benefits everyone. Um, I've had professors who copyright their exams, and, and you can't share them, uh, and I think that makes a sense. I mean, I completely understand being proud of one's work, but I think that sharing it with other people and uh, it's giving it another use and uh, augmenting the value of your work. I would just have to agree with Robert. Just trust the students. It's shocked me the talented, talented people that are in every nook and cranny of our school at College of the Canyons. It blows me away. Every time I talk to a student, they're, not only are they interested in the idea of open, it's, there's something about it. It's altruistic. It makes them feel like they're a part of something bigger and they and they are and we all are and they're they're just brilliant i mean i constantly talk to students almost on a daily basis where i'm like they should they should have my job they should do this so yeah trust the students okay i guess i'm facilitating this here i wasn't told <laughs> that i have to <laughs> here we are thank you for this where's igor <laughs> 
Okay, so any more questions? Interesting what came up here about trust, and I think um, the important factor is to trust students. I'm coming. Um, yes, what about staff? Would, okay, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, Matilde Fontanini, University La Sapienza. Um, so like somebody said last night, a late PhD student. Um, so I'm, both si I'm on both sides. Uh, something, since I'm a librarian, forgive me about it, but uh, <laughs> something you said about sharing makes me feel, since I worked inside university for many years, what I feel is, I don't know how you feel about it, there's a kind of um, problem in communication maybe, so there are a lot of resources already working on certain topics and they don't get together. So to make an example, Julia was speaking earlier about sharing resources, creating a platform. What I notice is even open access publications on, are on open repositories and you have to go and look into every single open repository. So why don't we just make an effort and involve uh, large databases that are already there. So archive worked, okay? It changed the world. If we have open access, we owe it somehow to the stubbornness of somebody who created a globally shared resource. So why don't we just skip on the train of, you know, large catalogs, which are already there, and um, showcases for, for everyone to see? Well, I completely agree with you. Um, uh, I think the problem is not just that people don't share, but those who do, do not advertise enough the work they've done, and so you end up having to look for material in different platforms and wasting a lot of time. Uh, and, but I personally think that the only one who can do that is the university, because it's big enough to get everyone together and share the work that everyone is doing inside and outside the university. I, I maybe like uh, add one thing about sharing and, and, and like, um, maybe more generally also about like open technology and so on. I think there's a, there's a, a massive opportunity if like open databases or open software tools or whatever, if they are designed in a user-friendly way because we live in a time where um, convenience is everything and especially for students. Um, especially students when they have like a lot of a workload to do and uh, maybe they, they're not yet at the level where they can like see how they can, you know, become involved themselves and they're just trying to get by and, and you know, pass their exams and so on. Um, if we want them to take part in these kind of, or use these tools, we have to make them as user friendly as possible and that's, this has a lot to do with design and, and I think there's a massive opportunity to, to make um, open tools much more user-friendly. So if there are no more questions, I think that our time is finished. <laughs> so thank you everyone and thank you first of all for your effort. Okay, since everybody is still here, um, there's a coffee break now and then uh, we'll go off to different sessions. Okay, thank you. Um, the conference committee has asked me badges. So if you need any help, find any of us and we'll all send you to Igor. <laughs> like we agreed. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>